Did you hear the news from Rome? Simon asked excitedly as he burst into his friend Joseph's workshop. The followers of that Crestus fellow are causing an uproar again among the Jews. Joseph sighed and put down his tools. As a craftsman, he tried to stay focused on his work and avoid getting caught up in the endless religious debates that seem to consume the Jewish community these days. What is it this time? He asked wearily. Apparently this Crestus, or Christ as some call him, is dead, executed by the Romans but his followers are claiming he rose from the dead and ascended to heaven as the Son of God. Can you believe it? Simon's eyes were wide. Joseph frowned. Sounds like another of these self-proclaimed messiahs. There have been so many in recent years, each one gathering a band of misguided followers before meeting a bad end. I don't understand why our people keep falling for it. But this one seems different, Simon insisted. They say he performed miracles, that he was born of a virgin, that foreign magi came to honor him at his birth when a star appeared in the sky. The pagans are starting to believe the stories too, not just some of our people. Joseph waved a dismissive hand. Of course the pagans believe it. It's the kind of myths and legends they adore, full of demigods and magic and dramatic signs. So much more appealing than the sober truth and strict laws of our God. Simon looked at his friend probingly. But what if… what if it's not just myth this time? What if this Yeshua really was who he claimed to be, the son of the living God, the one the prophets foretold? Shouldn't we at least consider the possibility? Joseph met his gaze. Frankly, no. I cannot fathom the Almighty having a son, let alone one born of a virgin mother impregnated by the Holy Spirit. It goes against everything we believe as Jews about the oneness and uniqueness of God. Nor can I accept a crucified criminal as the Messiah. The pagans may fall for such tales, but we know better. Simon was quiet for a long moment. I heard this Yeshua taught with great authority and wisdom, that he healed the sick, gave sight to the blind, even raised the dead. Many say the kingdom of God has come near through him. So say his misguided followers, of course, Joseph replied. But extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Show me the lame walking and the dead rising, and then perhaps I'll consider it. But I've seen nothing to overthrow a lifetime of belief and obedience to the God of our fathers. You're probably right, Simon acknowledged. I suppose I just hoped. Well, never mind what I hoped. The world remains as it is, as it has always been. I should get back to work. As should I, Joseph agreed, though he put a comforting hand on his friend's shoulder before he turned to go. We'll speak again soon. But in truth, they spoke little in the weeks and months that followed. Simon couldn't shake his fascination with the stories of this crucified teacher and the strange new sect arising in his name. He began spending time with them, listening to their teachings, observing their way of life. Slowly, Imperceptibly at first but with growing conviction, he found himself drawn to the profound love and joy he saw in their community, so different from the fear and legalism that characterized the Judaism he had always known. He wrestled deeply with questions of identity and truth and the way to God. Finally, he could resist no longer. He believed that Yeshua was the Christ, the Son of the living God, and he was baptized into his name and the way of life he taught and embodied. When word of Simon's conversion reached Joseph, he was stunned and bitterly disappointed. He mourned the loss of his dear friend almost as a death. How could Simon abandon the faith of their people, defile himself by associating with pagans and outcasts, place his hope in a crucified blasphemer rather than the Almighty God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? It was madness, sheer folly. In anguish, Joseph redoubled his commitment to the orthodoxy and orthopraxy of his faith, determined to cling to the traditions and laws that had sustained his people through centuries of suffering and oppression. He cut off all contact with Simon and withdrew even further into his work and his religious community. On the increasingly rare occasions that he saw his former friend on the streets, he averted his eyes and hurried past. The gulf between them seemed unbridgeable now. The years marched on. The Jewish revolt against Rome came and went, ending in catastrophic defeat and the destruction of the Great Temple. 
In the tumultuous decades that followed, Simon and his small band of Christ followers found themselves increasingly at odds with the Jewish religious establishment, seen as dangerous heretics threatening the already precarious existence of a conquered and dispersed people. Persecution intensified, first from fellow Jews and later from the Roman authorities as well. Many fell away. Others were imprisoned, beaten, killed. Simon himself bore the marks of suffering for his faith. Through it all, he and his brothers and sisters clung to one another and to the teachings of their crucified and risen Lord. Their way was not easy, but it was marked by a startling hope and an unshakable conviction that God was doing something new in the world. As the decades passed, so too did Joseph's youth and vigor. His wife died, his children grew and started families of their own. He continued in his work as long as his hands could hold the tools, but eventually he had to step back and cede responsibility to his sons. Through it all, he remained steadfast in his beliefs and practices, faithful to the God who had sustained him through both plenty and want. And yet, and yet there were moments, usually in the deep stillness of the night, when questions arose that he could not entirely push away. Haunting memories of the light in Simon's eyes as he spoke of the Christ, the peculiar power and presence in those ragtag communities even amidst great hardship and opposition. Was it possible, was it conceivable, that he had missed something essential? That the one true God could act in ways he had never dared to imagine? In his waning years, as his strength faded and his mind wandered ever more frequently to the past, Joseph found himself thinking often of his old friend. He hadn't seen Simon in a long, long time, hadn't even thought of him, in truth, except to occasionally lament his lostness and pray for his restoration. Joseph wasn't sure what impelled him now curiosity, regret, a vague but persistent sense that some resolution was needed before he departed this life. Whatever the reason, he sent word through his son, asking if Simon would agree to meet. And so it was that on a warm spring evening, as the shadows lengthened and the bustle of the city quieted, Two old men sat across from each other in the courtyard of Joseph's home. Simon had arrived hesitantly, not knowing what to expect after so many years of estrangement. But as he looked into Joseph's lined and weathered face, he saw only kindness. They began haltingly, with polite inquiries into families and livelihoods. But before long, the years fell away and they were talking as they had in their youth, words tumbling out in an effort to traverse the distance between them. They spoke of heartaches and hopes, of questions that remained stubbornly unanswered, of the winding and often bewildering paths their lives had taken. Most of all, they spoke of God, of who He was, what He wanted, how He could be known. There were still chasms of belief between them, but there was also, increasingly, a sense of something deeper still that bound them together. A shared awe at the magnificent mystery of it all, a trembling hope that one day all would be made clear and whole and right. As the last light faded and the stars emerged, Joseph reached across the space between them and gripped Simon's weathered hand in his own. I still don't understand it, he said softly. This strange story you've staked your life on, but I've seen the fruit of it in you. The peace, the love, the enduring hope. And that, as much as anything, makes me wonder. Simon met his eyes, his own shining with unshed tears. It is the greatest wonder of all, he said, that the God of our fathers is doing a new thing, bringing his light to the nations, welcoming all into his family as dearly loved children, that he reaches out to us, even now, even here, inviting us into a story far greater than we could ask or imagine. Joseph nodded slowly. He felt the weight of his years, the ache of joints and the weariness of a mind that had grappled with the deepest questions for far too long. But he also felt a curious lightning, as if some burden had been lifted from him. Perhaps, he murmured, perhaps you are right, old friend. Perhaps it is time for me to consider this Jesus of yours more closely. I may not have much time, but what I have, what I have, I would like to spend seeking the truth. Will you help me? A radiant smile broke across Simon's face. It would be my greatest joy and privilege. And so it came to pass that in the final months of his life, Joseph pored over the ancient scriptures with new eyes, listening as Simon told once again the story of a baby in a manger, a teacher on a hillside, a healer in the streets, a crucified king, 
a resurrected Lord. Slowly, fitfully, Joseph began to see what Simon had seen, that this Jesus was the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets had pointed to, the long-awaited Messiah, the incarnation of God's own self. It was not a thunderbolt revelation, but rather a quiet dawning like the sun rising to fill the sky with light. And as Joseph drew his final breaths, it was with Simon's voice in his ear, reciting the words they had both cherished since childhood. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Only now, he understood those words as he never had before, that the oneness of God encompassed the wonderful mystery of Father, Son, and Spirit, that Jesus was the very image and essence of the divine. With that knowledge and the peace it brought, Joseph slipped from this world to the next. Simon wept as he buried his friend, giving thanks for a life so very well lived. And as he commended Joseph's spirit into the hands of the God he had served so faithfully, Simon rejoiced that the dividing wall between them had finally been torn down, that they were brothers once more in an eternal family. The story that had started in confusion and disruption so many years ago had come to a fitting end, though Simon knew it was really only the beginning.